Greetings and welcome to Remnant Speaks. I'm your host, the Reverend Dr. Coach J, coming at you live from Remnant Fellowship, that place that has a special space for young adults. As you know, we're here to engage, nourish, restore, and equip young adults for Christian service. Our podcast, all we want to do is talk and be for real. We're trying to get open dialogue. Remnant Speaks is more about dialogue than it is monologue because we can hear people talk all the time. But when we're able to talk amongst ourselves, dialogue, go back and forth, chop it up, then I think we tend to have a better understanding of the things that we have to do. So tonight, we have an excellent topic, but we have one of the most dedicated African Americans in America to talk about this topic that's so important to us. What's the topic? Strengthening Black families. So on tonight, I'm gonna introduce, let them introduce themselves, which is our custom. But we're gonna start off with first, someone that you already know, and that's our very own, Josh Skanderick. Josh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first off, let me start off by saying that I am honored to be back again amongst these great men. And I uh, wanna wish y'all a belated happy Father's Day. And um, I'm just happy to be back and uh, I'm ready to go. Let's get it started. Thank you, Josh. As always, you are the right-hand man, and I appreciate you, and I want to let you know that. And now we have the, the major speaker of the day or the hour, and that is none other than Dr. Wilson. Doc, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, who you're with, and what you do. Uh, Dr. Ben C. Wilson, retired professor, emeritus professor, Western Michigan University, Oh, gosh, darn it. I retired in 2005 from teaching at the university. But as long as I'm alive and there's air to breathe, I'm going to continue to teach people. And I hope they can pick up something from what I say occasionally. Because sometimes the stuff that I say might seem crazy to others, but to me, it's sane. I was born in Hillsborough County, Florida, Tampa. I was raised in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. As a matter of fact, I was the first African-American male to desegregate St. Thomas Aquinas High School in Fort Lauderdale. I was the first uh, athlete, well, one of the first black athletes to uh, participate in football and basketball at St. Thomas Aquinas. Wow. After graduating from St. Thomas Aquinas, my mother decided that uh, I should go to an all boys Catholic college in Kansas called St. Benedict's College. And that was a heck of an experience because I was one of 13 African-American males to desegregate the place. But I did yeah. learn something. If you're in the belly of the beast, you know how the beast responds to issues concerning people of color. Um, I got three wonderful daughters. One of them is this child named Danya, who is an elementary school teacher at the school you used to work at. I heard you are retiring. I hate to see that because, man, do we need male role models in elementary school? Yes, sir. And unlike Hillary Clinton, who stole a proverb from West Africa, saying it takes a village to raise a child, I'm going to add a little bit from South Africa to her comment. It takes a village to raise a child, but every child is my child in the community in which I live, Amen. which means that everybody has equal access to your behind if you step out of line. And stepping out of line, meaning you are not fulfilling your responsibilities as an African-American male. I'm talking about pursuing education to the extreme of the farthest you possibly can. God gave us a brain and we might as well maximize it. Um, 
that's enough on me. I do a lot of, I publish like four books and I'm in the process of doing documentary films on the African-American experience in Western Michigan. Mm. And you belong to the greatest fraternity in the world. Tell them, tell them about it, bro. And <laughs> here's the best That's part that. about it. All the rest of them are boy clubs. <laughs> well, but I tell you something, because we were started at Howard University where Carter G. Woodson was. Yes, sir. Carter G. Woodson was a teacher there and the founders of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity were faculty members there. And I'm certain they colluded to come up with Black History Month or Black History. I don't know why we call it month because I celebrate Black History every all time I get up. All year long. And, and thank God also for the AKAs because they too were involved in the formation of, uh, of the of, of Black History Month. Oh, I, like, I don't like that. Uh, black History, uh, African-American History. African and uh, I'm a firm believer, I'm a firm believer that uh, our young men, okay, need to be re-educated so that they can understand that African-American history did not begin in 1964 with the civil rights movement. Amen. Um, and sometimes when we study the African-American experience, we tend not to begin, we tend to begin, uh, we should begin with the African beginnings and then talk about the African experience in not only America, but the whole diaspora, wherever African people ended up, we had an impact on the countries in which we were forced to settle in, be it America, Brazil, Cuba, Jamaica. Imagine how this world would be without our presence. You know, I, I like country and Western music, but I kind of like hip hop and soul much better Okay. Yes, sir. Well, you know, hey, Doc, one of the things is Brother Josh and I, we have conversations all the time. And uh, he brought up one that uh, kind of spurred my heart. And I thought about you. And that's the reason why I called you. So I'm going to let Josh kind of lead us off in the discussion. Because some of the things that he wanted to talk about, um, I thought, you know, I, we could probably do it but we couldn't do it with such a masterful way in which you can. So I'm gonna let Josh ask you his first question and then we're gonna follow up and try to pick your brain a little bit and see what we can get that'll help us strengthen our black families. You Josh, got it. You got something for him? Okay. Um, well, my first question would definitely have to be, um, you know, you always hear everyone speak of, um, we need to do this as black people. We need to come together as black people. Everybody say and make these statements, but nobody actually has a, a, a direct plan on what we can do, how we should do it. And when we do come together, nobody's on the same page in what direction we should go. So I just kind of want to um, get your insight on what would you if you had to put together a plan on how to bring the black community back together, starting with the males, the men, what would that plan consist of or look like? Okay, first of all, Josh, you gotta keep in mind that even though we all have a dark skin, we're mm -hmm. not monolithic in thought. Okay. Okay, you know, that's the reason why we got black Democrats and black Republicans. <laughs> okay, we're talking about folks who are confused, but one of the first things we got to do is, you remember the parliaments and the funkadelics? Okay. The, the parliaments and funkadelics a long time ago, George Clinton, one of the people I like to talk about, George Clinton said, free your mind and your, and your butt will follow. <laughs> okay, so what you got to do is shake off the shackles on the brain. A, a, a psychologist named Bobby Wright a long time ago came up with a term called menticide. Basically, you know what a homicide is. You know what suicide is. 
You know what genocide is, okay? Menticide is the systematic destruction of your own brain mm. by the garbage that you would internalize about you, Africa, and anything that's dark. So one of the first things is the re-education process. Dr. Carter G. Woodson made a comment in one of his books. I can't remember which, which one it was. He said, it's extremely difficult to re-educate a miseducated fool. Wow. And okay. there are a lot of people who are credentialed, who are miseducated, OK? You got to keep in mind that the American educational system is not what people say it is. I think it's almost like a uh, a propaganda thing where you present this false history of America, this Alice in Wonderland myth approach, and people and people eat it up. Okay, so we're talking about a re-education process first, clearing the mind of excess garbage first. Okay. And then you can sit down and talk about a plan on which direction one should go in reference to strengthening the black family. Once upon a time, Coach and Josh, one of my former mentors, a guy by the name of Dr. Joseph McMillan, he's now dead, used to have a conference at the University of Louisville called the Black Family in America. And some of the scholars who presented there were Ron Karinga, Milana Ron Karinga, mm -hmm. Naeem Akbar, yeah. Bobby Wright, yeah. heavies. And they were a part of the process of trying to get folks to realize that the black family and strengthening the black family was crucial. Now, another thing we got to understand is I'm not trying to put down African-American men but most often African-American men in families are so busy trying to make sure that their family has food, clothing, and shelter. And the people who really are the educators are the people who continue the story about our experience are usually mothers, grandmothers, aunts, okay? But fathers can also play a, play a role by being good role models for their kids. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, it takes a village to raise a child, but any child is my child if it's in uh, he or she is born in my community. And everybody has a right to teach that young pe person how to live a life that is worthwhile. You know, God gave us all a purpose when he made us, okay? And it's up to us to fulfill that promise of maximizing our education, our learning experience, and our humanity. We have to do it ourselves. Uh, so learning would be one thing. I mean, re-education learning, opening one's eyes, okay, is another process. And then another process would be, sometimes people think that learning means going to school. And sometimes they would say things like, but they didn't teach me that in high school. Well, heck, I mentioned, I, I was graduated from high school in 1965 from St. Thomas Aquinas. The majority of the data I picked up, I went to a strange institution that a lot of people can't even pronounce. It's called the library. And I read, <laughs> and I read, because I realized that once you stop learning, you are dead. Well, let me ask you this, Doc. Um, because one of the things that, that I struggle with is the the gap the the generational gaps um right now we've got baby boomers boomers we've got the x y z generations coming up next and the whole ideal of parenting um the young adults that i that i have influence over uh have conversation with it seems to me that this ideal of parenting is something different um, and they're doing it different than the way I was parented and the way I parented as, mm -hmm. as, as having uh, children. So can you give us like a, a historical perspective of what parenting was as opposed to what it is now and how did it get this way? 
Well, sometimes uh, people talk about Generation X. Yeah. I call them Generation R. Oh. Generation rude. <laughs> okay. Generation disrespect for people with gray hair. Uh, generation of people who say, you and I, because we have gray hair, they call us old school. <laughs> but we here. <laughs> we ain't dead. Okay. We also know how to survive. Okay. Now, my parents, I was raised by my mother. My father was a career army officer. Okay. He was in the military. We got to see daddy whenever he got his 30-day leave. But mom was the one who was the driving force. My mother was a school teacher. All of my other mothers, you know what I mean by that? I'm talking about all of her friends also were parenting me, okay? They showed me how, okay? Uh, when I went to school in Kansas, you know how it is when you go to school, your parents would send you as a poor kid a care package? Yeah. That might include potted meat, Vienna yeah. sausages, yeah. sardines. Yes. I had five mothers who did the same thing. And those five mothers also would ask me questions about how are you doing in school? And I had to give them a response. And sometimes they would ask me questions that I couldn't answer. Like the question that Josh asked. Josh, there is no simple answer to the problem on how we can come up with a, a blueprinted plan, plan. Because as I mentioned before, we're not monolithic. Boy, Miss Simmons, Miss Alzora Simmons, she was one of my mothers. She was a school teacher also. My area of interest was history, but she would ask me questions about physics. And then she would say something like, you supposed to know, you going to college, okay? And I forced myself to learn physics, okay? Took classes in physics. Didn't do too well, but I took those classes because of Mrs. Simmons. And then there was Miss Pothenia Ham, who did the same thing. And then there was my sixth grade teacher by the name of Mr. Ben Williams. Mr. Ben Williams said, boy, all of y'all black kids can rap. You can talk. You can convince people by your rap. But how are you going to com communicate your thoughts if the person is in California? So he was the guy who emphasized to me the importance of writing on how to express my ideas to people in a manner in which they could understand. I'm not talking about Jeff's African-Americans, but everybody. So when I went into the belly of the beast, I learned how to communicate with those folks. But at the same time, I can tell you about the Chanson, Chanson de Roland. I can tell you about Beowulf. I can tell you about Shark Chaucer's Canterbury Tales but I can also tell you about Stagger Lee. Back home again, black again. When I was with them folks, yes, sir. I played the game. Yes, sir. I took French, I took Latin. But when I went back to the hood, back home again, black again, what's up, bro? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, it's not an easy thing, especially when you're talking to babies who are having babies. Okay. And sometimes you look, when I walk, drive through my neighborhood, sometimes I see young ladies with a stroller and two following behind them because they think, they think that just by having a baby, that's how you raise a baby. Okay. You change the diaper, you feed them baby food, and you pray that the teachers would teach your kids boys and girls, how to become mature. That's the responsibility of the parent. But there is always light at the end of the tunnel because there's always some young brother or sister who's doing something that makes you feel proud even though you were not directly involved in their development. It's almost like all three of us sitting playing with a pile of clay. We don't know what the finished product will be, but we did have our hands on those children's hands 
who was shaping this artist, this art called whatever it might be from that clay. It's a hard process, but it can be done. You know, brothers, when I spend some time in West Africa and in Zimbabwe and South Africa, young men and women were initiated into manhood, mm -hmm. womanhood, almost like a fraternity. But dog, in America, all you got to do is be 18 and you just slide into, it. into adulthood. But you're not really an adult, okay? Because, you know, like, it's almost like a metamorphosis that occurs. We all start off as babies, infants, dependent little leeches, okay? When we want something, we do, babies do not articulate stuff. They cry, Why? okay? That's almost like a caterpillar. And the caterpillar is supposed to evolve into a butterfly. But sometimes once you get comfortable being a baby, you stay there. As yeah. a matter of fact, you are so much a baby that you call your significant other, my baby. <laughs> and you go over to her crib, which is like a baby crib. Now the mm. next process in this metamorphosis is from caterpillar to cocoon. But suppose mm. you're comfortable being a cocoon called a boy or a girl. And you can tell a boy or a girl because the only words in their mind is mine, 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 mine. Me, myself, and I, mine. You can bring out a, a train set. The boy now might be 22, but he has this train, train, okay? Because to him, Maturity and being grown up means owning stuff, just stuff, you know? Like me and my partners on the golf course today were sitting back trying to wonder if 22 inch tires and spinner rims give you more miles per gallon. <laughs> okay, but that car is mine, mine, mine. Okay, when somebody touches your car, that's mine. But the ultimate thing in this metamorphosis process, I'm still using the caterpillar cocoon thing, is to become a butterfly. And once you become a butterfly, then you begin to realize that I'm a daddy. I'm a responsible daddy. I got to go to work to feed this little child that I helped to create, okay? And heck, I'm gonna have to change diapers. And if you can stand up to a baby's diaper loaded with poo-poo, I figure you can kick King Kong dead in the behind. <laughs> so it's the process that we go through, okay? Now what happens is, suppose you walk up to someone and try to explain to them that young man, you got to grow out of this little boy thing to become a man. And that young man tells you, man, get out of here old school. You don't know what you are talking about. At least you tried. Got you. At least but, you tried. But let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, and then I'm going to let Josh sneak back in. I, I, I got some of the things that I, I want to hear, and I want my, my people to hear. But do you think that there is a major difference in parenting Black children versus children of other ethnic groups? Yes, I do believe that. Because if you knew if you stepped out of line, when you were five or six years old at the grocery store, your mama would slap the taste out your mouth. <laughs> or she would drop another threat on you. I will beat you till you rope like okra. Mm. <laughs> and she would also say something like, it's hurting me more than it's hurting you, but you never I've see any that. tears coming from her eyes. I've, I've heard <laughs> now, that. I've seen people from other ethnic groups let their little kids go hog wild on the grocery store. If they can't get the frosted flakes that they want, they would do a temper tantrum. Man, if I did that with Winifred Wilson, my biological mother, or with Miss Parthenia Ham, one of my other mothers, or Miss Alzora Simmons, my other mother, or Cherry Chance, my other mother, Boy, they would run me over with the grocery cart and then leave me at the store. Okay, I'm not saying 
I'm not saying uh, brutalize your child, but I'm talking about, hey, hey, uh, uh, I remember many a times my mother who acted like a ninja, okay, I would do something wrong and I would take a shower and go to bed and think that she had forgotten mm. that I needed to be checked because of my behavior. Oh man, like a ninja, like Bruce Lee, she would sneak up on me at three o'clock in the morning while I'm asleep and start the dusting and talking. I'm doing oh, this yeah. because I love you because you stepped out of line and this is what you should do. Here, take this one, watch out. I love Ooh. you, <laughs> I love you, okay? Now, <clears throat> there are some people who are non-African-American. I think they have a strange psychosis. They will beat a person of color down and then expect them to love them. Is that making any sense? I mean, if you dog me, hurt my feelings, psychologically abuse me, physically abuse me, and then you expect me to love you? I know I'm a Christian man, but that's hard to do. Now, the only person who can do that and get away with it were my mother's and my father when sometimes he got me. And one of the things, one of the things that we really dealt with, because my father was a stern disciplinarian. My mother would whip me. Notice, whip me. My daddy would beat me. <laughs> and there is a difference. Now, you, you knew that if you stepped out of line and your daddy came home, your mother's going to tell your daddy. And the first thing your daddy's going to say is, let's go to the basement. Oof. He ain't taking you down the basement so you can drink some gin and coke. He's taking you down there to deal with your crazy behavior. Heck, yeah, we raise our kids differently, okay? I'm talking about responsible parents. Mm -hmm. But those babies who are having babies don't know anything about disciplining their kids. Because I get so sick and tired of turning on the national news, and we're finding people between the ages of 14 and 40 who don't have an ability to communicate, the first thing they will start doing for their gap and start shooting. No, that, something's wrong with that. But heck yeah, man, my mother, my mother and all of her friends who were my mother and my father, they didn't take no mess. Okay. What you got for it, John? Huh? What you got for So I guess my, my next question would have to be, um, has been a... <laughs> a black man who is a father, um, as far as the re-education, where, where does it start? I know you said the library and I, I, I found myself the past year or so um, doing a lot more research and reading and a lot more reading than I did when I was younger. And uh -huh. by means am I that much older, I'm only 35, but you know, I do a lot more reading and stuff than I did when I was in my twenties. You know, yeah. I'm, I have a hunger for the knowledge now. So um, where, where would you suggest that we start to get this information? What you would do is make sure that when you start reading, you have a boy or a girl, or does it Both. matter? Make sure they see you reading. Okay. Okay. When my oldest daughter was born and I was at Michigan State struggling on a small graduate assistantship trying to provide for my family, Whenever I did readings, I would lay over the bed, the book down below, and my daughter would be right on the side, okay? Now, she didn't know what I was reading, but she saw me looking at this doggone book. And later on, then you began to see African-American scholars producing books for little children. Mm. You can check out John Steptoe, who did the piece, you know, for little kids. You can also check out early documentaries on African American history that it is, excuse me, that are designed for young minds. You can also, there's an excellent video that I've, I've picked up called Karaku and the Sorcerer. It's about this African proper, proverb, but it featured a little boy. So if they see you reading, if they, if you, if they go with you to the library, if they see anybody pursuing education or reading or trying to find out about themselves, it might have an impact on them. Pray that it has an impact on them. Uh, 
Suppose you are interested in learning a foreign language. Get a Rosetta, so a Rosetta Stone. And of course, if you pick up the Rosetta Stone, there's only one African language on it. They might have 26 languages that are Eurocentric. There's one on Swahili. You and your yeah. kids can learn it together, okay? Do you travel a lot? I'm not talking about internationally, but you can go to places like, uh, not only on Auburn Avenue, but over near Augusta, I think it's off the Low Drive in Southwest Atlanta, there mm -hmm. is a home that was a place for, oh gosh, dog. oh man, oh uh, man, George Chandler Harris House. You go to places like that, okay? If the kids are interested in science, I will go to the Coca-Cola Museum so the kids can taste the Coca-Cola because they think the Coca-Cola in the States tastes the same way as Coca-Cola in Ghana. It's a different flavor, okay? Yeah. Uh, when you go out to food or go out to eat dinner, you might want to carry them to a West Indian res restaurant, okay, or an African restaurant so that they might taste the difference in foods that were created by our people, okay? And they might begin to realize that, hey, okra, that's from West Africa. They might begin to realize, hey, this rice, that's from West Africa, okay? Especially the rice that was grown in South Carolina. And they began to eat their black eyed peas, which are supposedly bringing you good luck. They would realize that they are from Central Africa, okay? And watermelon, that too is from Africa. So what happens is there are other ways to skin the cat than going just to the library. Exposure, okay? Uh, whenever there's a museum, I'm sorry, a presentation of the African experience, whether it's in America or elsewhere, make sure the kids are there. When the kids look at your hair, you can explain to them, this is the way that I want to wear my hair. And as a matter of fact, here are some hairstyles worn by people who look like me from West Africa. And you know what's really funny, both of you? Man, when I was in Ghana, last night I was a, a visiting, was it the International Fellow, International Faculty Development Seminar in Ghana, like 15 or 20 faculty members from various universities were there. As a matter of fact, one of the guys was from Morehouse. No, no. The guy from when we went to South Africa, there was a guy named Franklin Mont. No, Franklin, I can't think of his name, but he, went, he was an instructor at Morehouse. But anyway, when I got to Ghana and stepped off the plane in Accra, one of the first things I saw while going around the roundabout on the way to Lagoon, where the University of Africa, I mean, University of Ghana was, was a big old billboard talking about bleaching creams in Ghana, West Africa. Now, so now, dog, not only have we been systematically messed up, but the Ghanaians, the Africans had been messed up because of the European colonial experience. Brother Josh, I saw sisters in Ghana, they blacker than both me and you and coach, had green contact lens on. I ran because they looked like children from the dam. I was expecting fireballs to come out their eyes. I say, man, and it's almost like, it's almost like once upon a time when I was a kid, people would say things like, boy, you sure got good hair. And in my simple mind, that coach, I was saying, if hair's so good, how come we take it out of our food when we find it? If it's so good, why don't we eat it? <laughs> okay. Uh, God made me the way that I am. I'm not going to bleach my hair. I'm going to bleach my skin, put in the chemicals in my hair because it's blasphemous. God gave me that. He don't make no errors. Well, he did. He made snakes and spiders and bats because I'm petrified of it. <laughs> but that's the way to deal with it. Josh, I lost you. No, we're good. Let, let me ask you this. The, the, the idea of where we are right now as, as young adults, what's, what's, your, what's your thoughts about um, how do we uh, realign the ship? How do we get it back in some type of, 
position so that we can move forward stronger on a political uh, on a political stance. I would sit on the hymns of Stacey Abrams. Whatever Stacey Abrams does, if I'm a young person, I am going to follow her because that sister's on the ball. I would also, every night when I get on my knees and pray, I would thank God for John L. Lewis. You got to remember your heroes, okay? And listen to the heroes. Man, I would certainly be calling not Dr. Martin Luther King, but Saint Martin Luther King, okay? Reach back to the elders. They are the ones who helped us get where we are at the present time, okay? As young people, you got to realize that history didn't begin when you were born. <laughs> we are standing upon the shoulders of those who came before us. That's why we are tall, okay? I am standing on the shoulders of my mother, Miss Alzora Simmons, Parthenia Ham, Cherry Chance, my daddy, we're standing upon the shoulders of others. But a lot of young people don't appreciate history because they are into immediate results. I'm talking about, uh, what you call it? Immediate gratification. Let's call that the McDonald mindset. The McDonald hamburger mindset. Yeah. You pay, you get your goods. We're talking about immediate gratification. Okay, have you ever seen a person pull up to McDonald's to order something because it's supposedly quick food, unhealthy food at that, and they tell you, hey, wait a minute, you got to pull over to the side and wait for 15 minutes because, but they go crazy yeah. because they're into immediate gratification. Now, I used to tell my daughters, all three of them, Danya, Nikki, and Ayana, the good things come to those who wait. Okay. You're not going to get your pie in the sky just because you want it. You got to work for it. Good things come to those who wait and get away from this immediate gratification concept and check out the elders who helped build the foundation upon which we live on. You know, the part that really makes me sick though, coach, mm -hmm. we talk about all our superheroes who laid this foundation for us on how to achieve complete freedom, equality, justice, a lot of your young people are destroying that foundation because they don't know anything about their ancestors. Am I making any sense? Yes, sir. I mean, yeah. if you want to build a house, you don't start from the top. You start with a foundation, you start and build up. But dog, if you destroy the foundation or disregard the foundation, how are you going to get to the top? It's almost like people who say things like reach for the stars. Well, you might not be able to, to get a star. At least reach for the top of your house. That's closer than ground level, but keep on pushing. And you know the thing that's really cool too? A lot of the pop culturalists could be involved in this process. I remember once upon a time, man, I saw Stevie Wonder teaching the ABCs on Sesame Street. Yeah. It was effective. Yeah. Imagine if all the rappers got together and start rapping on trigonometry, mm -hmm. philosophy, <laughs> theology. Because I know young kids walking down the street, man, who can tell you every word of any rap song that has come out by the hip hop rappers from Atlanta, but they can't even do the seven time tables. Right. I mean, if you can understand rap, you should be able to write poetry if you wanted to. Yeah. Uh, and I think sometimes young people choose wrong role models. Right now, man, since Atlanta Hawks won their game, I bet you nine kids want to be like Trey Young but they can't even shoot. They can't even shoot a layup. I mean, come on, bro. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. I mean, there's nothing wrong to grow up and aspire to be like Trey Young, but just in case you still have 11 more eggs in the basket instead of just one that you're depending upon. Coach, am I making any sense to you? Yes, sir.
Yes, sir. I, I, I'm soaking it up. And we've got, and, and see, and this is what happens. As soon as we get into the, to the nuts and bolts and the, and the deep part of the podcast, it's that time. So we're going we're gonna to try to end this evening with our magic wine question. We've done an hour already? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wow. So here's our magic wine question. And you take the time to explain it to us and maybe help us to understand it. We hear it a lot right now. We know it's a big thing going on over in Texas. It has something to do with the, the voter suppression. It has something to do with some political um, uh, parts of the educational system. But it's the idea of uh, CRT, critical race theory. So my magic wand question to you, Doc, would be, do you think teaching critical race theory in our schools will strengthen our Black families in America? Not only Black families, but white families also, because we got to get beyond alternative truths in history. Sometimes people don't know the difference between myth and reality, okay? If it was wrong in 1660 to create race-based race -based chattel slavery, in 1660 was wrong, it's just as wrong in 2021, okay? In addition to it, the good people of Texas got to understand the difference between a servant, a slave, okay, quite different. As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't understand the difference between, as I mentioned, racial slavery, biblical slavery, and Greco-Roman slavery okay, of the classical era. Slavery in America was race-based chattel slavery. That's why in 1954, Kenneth Stamp in his book, The Peculiar Institution Called Race-Based Slavery in America, Peculiar. He didn't say biblical slavery was the peculiar institution. He didn't say classical Greek or Roman slavery was the peculiar institution. And you got to understand when you do that, when you, I think the reason why critical race theory needs to be taught is because my grandmama Lillian Bosa Wilson used to say some things that didn't make much sense to me. She would say things like fruit doesn't fall too far away from the roots of this tree. Mm -hmm unless the tree is on a hill, a hill I'm talking about, okay? Now, if you want to get rid of this crazy idea that servants <laughs> instead of slaves, as they did in some textbooks in Texas, you have to start at the root, okay, to understand it. It's almost like if you pick an apple from the tree, you got a beautiful apple on the tree. That apple is beautiful and tastes well, not because of its appleness, it's because of the root that's there. And if you began to study critical race theory, you got to start, I think, when kids are like in junior high school. Okay, I would start at a junior high school <clears throat> because I got to appease other people. But dog, if I were a superintendent of all education in the world, <laughs> I would start teaching once the kids got into the third or fourth grade. You know, have you ever watched kids in first through kindergarten through third grade? They don't pay attention to what color you are. As a matter of fact, when they're in kindergarten or third grade, they like going to school. Sometimes on Saturday, little kids are standing at the bus stop, getting ready to go to school, thinking, I uh, forget that the day was Friday, I mean, Saturday. But once you begin to throw in competition instead of cooperation in education, that's when you begin to see some problems with kids, okay? Because K through three, they have fun <laughs> learning. Yeah. But once you get to fourth grade, that's when they start competing against each other. Critical race theory needs to be taught in our systems, okay? It not only will help black families, but all American families. In addition to teaching critical race theory, 
Included in it should be the idea of respect for others, regardless of the texture of their hair, regardless of the, the hue of their skin. Respect is a thing. Because right now we're in a period that I call tolerant coping. <laughs> okay. I will tolerate you, but I don't have to respect you. Okay. But I will tolerate your presence. And it always amazes me that people always say things like, hey, man, why y'all got to celebrate Black History Month? And I would look at them and say, well, same reason why y'all drink green beer on St. Patrick's Day. The same reason why you celebrate uh, Tulip Festival in Holland, Michigan, <laughs> okay? Holland, Michigan was settled by Dutch people. Man, they even have the paper, one of the papers written in Dutch, <laughs> okay? But, but they call us hyper and nationalists. I hope it's, my daughter just told me it's time to cut off because we're going over. <laughs> but hey, man, it's been a pleasant talk with you fellas. And when I get down to Atlanta, I want to meet both of you. Hey, Josh, you make sure, man, your kids are the most important thing in your life. Because, oh, yes, sir. because you know, Josh, uh, when, when we leave this earth and transition elsewhere, I am so glad there is a place for me to go. I hope that it's heaven, okay? But imagine if you came back not as the father of your two kids, but suppose you came back as a chicken in the black community. <laughs> you, you, you're I being be a, too happy. <laughs> they will fry you, barbecue you, <laughs> dumpling you, because we can work wonders with chicken. Right. <laughs> I definitely wouldn't be happy about that. <laughs> you guys take care. And, and coach, congratulations on reaching your retirement. But you know what? Once you stop going to work, you don't retire. You continue to work. Yeah, well, <laughs> you continue. Go ahead. That's that's what I hope to do. <laughs> Y'all, you will. You 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 know, Mega Man. We continue to work. Man, well, ladies care. and gentlemen, that concludes another remnant speaks. I want to thank our single panelist, Dr. Benjamin C. Wilson. I want you to know that you're always welcome at anything we do at Remnant Fellowship, Doc. You are a brother to me. You are a father to me. But most of all, old. you are a friend to me. Okay, a friend, not that father. <laughs> <laughs> and at this time, I pray that the doors of heaven and the windows of heaven will open up a blessing that will pour out so much that it will overflow your cup and you will have to drink from your saucer. I will. You have just heard Remnant Speaks. God bless you and may heaven shine upon you. Take care, both fellas. <laughs>